It happens every summer. Stargazers delight in the opportunity to view constellations that can't be seen in winter, while car lovers delight in the opportunity to own one of our stars. At the Mercedes-Benz Summer Event, you can get the Mercedes-Benz of your dreams for less than you thought possible, like the supremely intelligent E-Class sedan or the awe-inspiring GLC. Don't miss this once-in-a-summertime opportunity. Hurry in to our summer event. Visit MBUSA.com to learn more. Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Blog Talk Radio. Best-selling and award-winning author of true crime and crime fiction, Yvonne Mason is back with a brand new book, The Pink Canary, a book that delves into the life of a drag queen and a marvelous whodunit. You can find this and all of Yvonne's other works on Amazon.com or find Yvonne Mason on Facebook and Twitter. You're gonna kill me. Buy your copy of Pink Canary now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Thursday night. I am your host, Yvonne Mason, and this is Off the Chain. And, of course, that was a piece of shameless promotion. My good friend and ad man, Chris Dunham, does all my ads for my books, and, as you see, he does a marvelous job. That particular book, The Pink Canary, is a comedy whodunit, which takes place down in one of my favorite cities in the entire world, Key West. And it is about a drag queen who is also a private investigator who gets caught up in a murder, and the murder happens behind her club, The Pink Canary. One of my really, really good friends, Peter Fundura, is in the book as Penelope, who is the comic relief in the book, and then a very, very wonderful, wonderful friend of mine who I happened to come across when I was working on the book and looking to make sure the culture of the book was correct, Vicki Lane. She was a premier drag queen in New York and in Canada, and she is the one that led me through the maze of the drag queen culture and the do's and don'ts and etiquette and procedures and all the things that, that these drag queens do to get ready to perform. And I'm going to tell you what, they got a lot more courage than I do because I can barely take five minutes to get dressed to go out. They take eight hours to get dressed to perform under hot lights. So read The Pink Canary. Vicki is also in the book. Read The Pink Canary and prepare to laugh yourself silly. On that note, I want to welcome a new sponsor to the show. Her name is author Diane Moat. And she has a great new children's adventure to tell us about. Pepper Neely Pet sits my pepper neely pet sits magical animals. I can't talk tonight, ladies and gentlemen. It's one of those nights. And in the first of the series, the supernatural pet sitter, the magic thief, someone begins stealing the magic from Pepper's animal friends. She has to find the magic thief before the magic thief finds her. The Supernatural Pet Sitter by Diane Mote is available on Amazon as an ebook or a paperback. So Plan ahead so you can entertain your kids on a long car trip or a rainy summer day. Again, the, natu- the Supernatural Pet Sitter by Diane Mote on Amazon. Reach out and get it today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, I am so grateful for every guest that I have on my show, for every listener that listens to the live show as well as the archives and all the podcasts that I put up. And I like to keep you all informed of where we are. We have now passed the 8,000 mark. We are at 8,700 plus listeners. We're 1,200, no, 88 plus, 8,800 plus, I'm sorry, 8,800 plus listeners on that show. We are 1,200 short of the 10,000 listeners just on Blog Talk Radio. As you all know, when I put up all the podcasts and this show goes into archives, we have over 20,000 listeners in 65-plus countries. So all of my guests get the added advantage of being heard in places they probably would never be heard, of getting the exposure that is well-deserved, that they have earned, and that is important for them to grow their base. And I have to say, Australia, y'all still have the USA beat and listens on Blog Talk Radio. You guys rock. 
they are beating out the USA three to one. They're seventy five percent of the listener base. So I want to say a shout out and a thank you to our friends down under for their continual support and listening of this show. So, ladies and gentlemen, tell your friends and relatives and complete strangers about this show. And if you want to be on this show, if you're an author, music, musician, an artist, you have a business, you have a platform, or you just want to chat for an hour, contact me on off the chain radio at yahoo.com and let's set up a show. We are booked now, ladies and gentlemen, through the end of the year. I am taking shows for the first quarter of next year. That's how busy we have been. And I am cannot be tickled to death. I am only the facilitator. My guests and my listeners are the engineers that drive this train, and I so appreciate it. So on that note, I want to welcome a new guest who will not a new guest for long because she hopefully will come back and visit us because she has some exciting things to tell us, and we're not going to get them through all of them tonight. Author Nancy Quinn joins us. And before I tell you about her bio, I have to say a big, huge thank you to her husband, who served our country for 30 years. He is a veteran, and I am privileged to be able to tell him thank you on this show and and thank Nancy for her sacrifice of, of loaning him to us for all those years. It is much, much, much appreciated by me. Nancy was born in Royal Oak, Michigan, but she has lived in many areas of our great country. She is an internationally known wildlife artist whose work is noted for its detail and accuracy, and she is the recipient of two World Wildlife Art Championship Awards. Nancy has always had a love of animals and nature, so after college she worked as a conservation law enforcement duty officer for the state of Florida. She volunteered her spare time at wildlife rehabilitation centers, bringing their birds and reptiles into the schools to educate children of all ages. Over the years, Nancy has handled many domestic and exotic species, including, ladies and gentlemen, cougars, leopards, and tigers, and always had had interesting stories to tell about her encounters with these beautiful wild animals. Upon leaving a suburban lifestyle in the metro Washington, D.C. area to live in rural Montana, Nancy discovered a new world of exciting and unusual adventures. So she was encouraged by her friends and family alike to write her first book titled Go West, Young Woman. Nancy now happily resides on a mountainside in Montana with her husband, her daughters, her dogs, and two horses, where she continues to paint and write about her experiences living in the still Wild West. And her tagline, ladies and gentlemen, which I just fell in love with when I read it, was from, I'm going to let you say it, Nancy, because I just went brain stupid. Oh, that's fine. From military wife to country life. There you go. I don't know where it went, but it just went. Sometimes that happens. (laughs) Welcome to you know, our I, show and and to one brain stupid <laughs> host. No, I I believe those thoughts go to the same place that the socks go to when you lose them in the dryer. How right you are. Now, Bill Cosby said that that his thoughts when he turned forty, he would think about he needed to go get something, so he'd walk in a room to go get it. And he would forget what he was there for, so he would sit down, go back and sit down, and then he would remember it. So he knew where his thoughts went in the seat of his pants. <laughs> so, so welcome to our show, from military life to from military life wife to country life. I'll get my tongue untwisted in a minute. <laughs> I am I am just so tickled you were here. I was reading about you, and I'm going, God, I can't wait to get this woman on my show because her love, not just of, of, of life in, in general, but your love of the arts and of wildlife and all the adventures and misadventures, how in the world did you get from from D.C. to Florida to all points in between? Did it start as a, as a young girl? How did you get here? 
Well, it actually wasn't my dream. Uh, it was my husband's dream. As a young man, he came out to western Montana and traveled in different parts of the state and fell in love with it. So later, when we were getting ready to retire, he said, I'd really like to move to Montana. I wasn't really sure. But when we made the plans, we went out here on a trip. I toured different parts of the state. And I have to admit that I fell in love with it, too. It has, it has amazing beauty. Honestly, as an author, I should be able to come up with the words to describe what it's like here. And I'm afraid I'm falling a little short. Maybe I do better writing than I do speaking. But there was so much to offer. And we had two young daughters, and it seemed like a really good place to raise a family. So I agreed to do it, and we made some plans and, and loaded up all of our things over time and basically kind of in our own little style of covered wagon, which was a, a Ford truck and a tarp on the back of our trailer, um, we headed on west. Well, let me ask you something. As a child, did you have a desire to be a writer or an artist, or was it something that evolved over time as you were growing up? Oh, I think it definitely evolved over time. Um, when I was young, my dream actually was to be a vocalist and win a Grammy Award. Wow, that's a good dream. Yeah. What changed? Well, it is. I, uh, I studied voice. I'm classically trained. My, my voice instructors were actually from Juilliard and Northwestern. I couldn't afford to go to the schools, but I did manage to raise enough money to uh, take private lessons from them. And so I sang for a long time professionally. But, you know, later I just decided it wasn't right for me. And so I did what I always did, which was my artwork. And my artwork helped pay for college. My artwork was extra money when I was in law enforcement. And everybody said, why aren't you doing this wildlife art? Well, at the time, I didn't think I had the courage to give it a try full time. But later I did, and I was very fortunate uh, because it it enabled me to make, you know, to make a living with it. Would it be fair to say that you took a leap of faith in in yourself as a dreamer to do something different and make it work? And and the reason I ask that question is because all of us that are artists are dreamers, and some of us fail to follow through with a dream because we are afraid we're not good enough. Well, there's failure in not trying. Would you agree with that? I completely agree with that. In fact, I think that every dream or every goal that I've ever had has been way out of my comfort zone. And it's scary, but I just decided I had to get out there and try. And even and you if succeeded. I failed a few times, yeah, but I, you know, I've, I've failed at things before, but I felt like if it was really important to me, I had to just get out there and try again. And maybe you didn't fail because you tried it. And the, the reason I use that analogy is because my brother is challenged, and he believes he can do anything. And to him, failure is never an option. And to him, failure is not at least getting out and trying. Because when you try, you succeeded because you went out and did it. You don't know that you can't do it if you don't at least go out and make an effort. Well, you're right. It doesn't necessarily, regardless of the outcome, it is successful when you get out there and try. So you're correct. I do agree with you. Now, you had an influence on you in your life that 
you lost at an early age, but I firmly believe, after reading all that I've read about you, that that influence has carried you through. Would you like to ex- expound on the influence in your life? Well, you know, there have been many, but I suppose the the most important one was my father. I don't really remember him very well because he died in a car accident when I was very young. I was I was six. But he was a very well-known and respected artist. His artwork was different from mine. Um, I, I basically focus on wildlife. But he was, he was very well-loved. He did a lot of charity work, um, did a lot of work with children's issues. And I think that his talent and his abilities were probably just passed down through me. I I really think I inherited them. I'm not formally trained as an artist. Um, Wasn't even sure if I could really make a living at it at the time, but there was just always something inside of me that comes from him. And any time I sit down to do any art, I actually have a self-portrait that he drew of himself as a young man, and it hangs on the wall above my drafting board. Doesn't get any better inspiration than that, my dear. That is a beautiful story. Because so he's always, I really do he's always a, watching. He's always watching over you now. I like to think so. I I miss him terribly. Everyone tells me that I am so much like him, and yet, as the years pass, my memories of him fade. Just because, you know, I was so young. Well, let's back up a little bit to your transformation from (laughs) the... (laughs) And we talked about this briefly, because I can Mm -hmm. just see in my mind's eye this, this, this transformation and move. Now, ladies and gentlemen... This young woman is living in D.C., the hub of our nation's politics. It's busy. It's it's 24-7. It's concrete and asphalt and blaring horns and traffic through the nose and history and everything under the sun. And they go across country to Montana, which I'm sure some people think still don't have indoor plumbing and electricity. But you'd be surprised. I hear a lot of that. <laughs> it's it's wild. It's not yet perverted by civilization as we know it and in a lot of areas I'm sure it's nature at her most beautiful bloom I'm sure there's not a lot of smog and pollution and you live on the side of a mountain what kind of culture shock what because I'm sure the grocery store is not right down the street so what kind of culture shock was that for you going from there's a 7-Eleven on every corner and constant traffic and noise and, and movement to calm and quiet and skies at night where you can see the stars. Well, everything you just said is completely true, and that's really one of the reasons why we decided to leave D.C. Um, we wanted a lifestyle that was a little calmer, a little quieter. I actually love the city and lived most of my life in them, places like Jacksonville, Florida, and Miami, and uh, Detroit, and, of course, Washington, D.C. It, it has so much to offer. But, you know, after September 11th happened and our lives changed so dramatically, we just decided we wanted to step out from, from all of it and try something new and live a little a little more peacefully. Um, and with my work, I've always been 
been attracted to the wild and the outdoors, and I, I actually feel more comfortable there. Of course, I really miss my good restaurants, <laughs> and I miss <laughs> a lot of the shopping and, and the theater and different things like that. But, you know, there's a trade-off no matter where you live. And That's true. we do have every night we have the most stunning and beautiful sunsets that you can ever imagine. I write about them in the book. Um, the stars at night, you can't compare them. The city lights don't interfere or compete. And when you look up at night, they're, well, they're just stunning. And it's it's soothing, and it's it kind of, it kind of heals your soul from the inside. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy being out here. As far as the culture shock, you're absolutely right. And if you have pictures of me in my nylons and high heels getting stuck in the mud, that's almost true. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've kind of had to change a lot of things. But I make a lot of jokes about it in the book because there is a part of me that will not change as far as my love of fashion and makeup and things like that. You're not going to take that away from me. So what I've been able to do is is just sort of blend the two cultures. I kind of fit into a point, but I still keep a lot of, of who I am, and sometimes it's it's rather comical. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that it makes great fodder for future stories and and the misadventures of Nancy Quinn. Well, it it really does. Between that and the weather, which everyone jokes here, we have nine months of winter and three months of poor skiing. And (laughs) there's, you know, there's some truth to that as well. Um, Montanans are very rugged individualists and... I think that that is just the West, um, and I think it's something that the West inherited and will always have, no matter how many years you are in the future. I, I think the West will always have its own kind of culture. And I agree with you, because the people that that migrated from Europe to the Americas had to be strong stock to begin with, but then when they went to a very brutal part of the country that it's, you know, hot in the daytime, freezing cold at night, snowstorms and floods at the drop of a hat, they had to Mm -hmm. become not only thick-skinned but thick-souled. Well, you do because... You you have to have that mindset that no matter what you get into, especially in rural life, no matter what you get into, that you can face it, that you can accomplish it, that you can overcome it, that you can do it. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were involved in, in and this is going to segue into where you live now, you were involved mm-hmm. with wildlife, with lions and, and not lions, but tigers and and coyotes and cougars, birds of prey. While you were in law enforcement, did that? Prop- and ladies and gentlemen, she handled these animals. She took them to school. She she educated people about these animals. Did that prepare you better? for when you moved to Montana, and you have cougars that that roam the mountainside and come to visit you. We do, and they, I have to tell you, if you move to Montana, you really need to rethink the idea of having a swing in their yard because they are cougar magnets. (laughs) Really? I, (laughs) I don't know why they like the swing so much. But they just do, you know. Maybe they're just cats, cats at heart. But, um, yes, I, I think being able to see those kinds of animals and have handled them on a fairly regular basis 
I don't think I was nearly as in, intimidated, um, you know, seeing them out in the wild. So I've, I've handled them in captivity. Uh, I wouldn't certainly try to handle a wild cougar, but um, I have enough information to to respect them and to, uh -huh. to keep it all in perspective. And that, that brings me, just briefly, to, I'm, I'm wanting to touch on the, the young woman, I don't know if you heard, down in West Palm that, that walked into a cage of a cat and was attacked by the cat because she didn't take the precautions she needed to protect herself. She didn't make sure the cat was in his night area before she walked in there. To me, that was foolishness because she didn't think it through and she knew better. That would be some, something you know, a I, novice would do. I've heard those kinds of stories before. Um, I've also heard the kind of stories where people think that, well, I have some type of a connection to this animal and it won't hurt me, or even the people who were actually permitted to have cougars as personal pets. After a while, when it gets big, it's still a wild animal. Even if you raise it, it's still a wild animal. It will always revert to its wild instincts. And any time I handled any type of wild animal, you know, I don't care if someone raised it or not or if it's in a private zoo or not, I had a high respect and regard for the fact that it was wild and I knew what kinds of risks I was taking. So you're very careful to, to make sure your risks are on the lowest level of the scale possible. Um, you know, when I handled the tiger, I actually, it, it, it was, a handler was there with me. And uh, the few times I've been and handled the cougars, somebody was always standing by. Um, I actually got pinned onto the wall with one that was, luckily, it was very young. And it was just playing with me. But had it not been, it could have been a very, a very serious problem, um, uh -huh. and you learn very quickly to to have a great respect for them. They, they might be cute, but they are not pets. No, oh, they are wild, and they, like you say, they behave like they're in, as if they're in the wild because that's the only way they survive. Well, sure, and even if they're in captivity, they've there is an element of frustration there even if they've uh -huh. been raised um, in captivity. And so they will always revert to their natural instincts. Wild animals, are they're beautiful, but they are very unpredictable. And I always handled them with a lot of respect. There's, there's no bravado over here from me. <laughs> respect the wildlife, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go, yeah. <laughs> trying, to, uh, don't go trying to catch them. Now, you also have two horses, and one of them is a camera hog. Oh, you must be talking about our Wilson. Yes. Yes, Wilson. I, I just did my first video with him, and it's only been released a few days ago. And I'm telling you, he just, he just stole the whole show. He's really fun. He's very friendly. And I don't know if I should spoil it or not. I... I would really like people to see it for themselves, but um, he go has ahead a habit. And tell them because tell them because then then they'll have to go over and see just how hilarious he is. Oh, okay. Well, in the book, I write about his habit of sticking his tongue out and just flapping it wildly in the breeze, and we always thought it was so funny. And I was doing the little video to introduce him as being one of the favorite characters in the book because a lot of people write and say, oh, we just loved your stories about Wilson. So when I did the video, the entire video, he's sticking his tongue out and he's flapping it around. And as I'm talking, and, and I just think he likes to have his picture taken and I think he likes the attention. I think he's a big ham. And, and you're going to have to do more with him to, because he's going to get a following, and people are going to want to know more about Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to go to Nancy Quinn's Facebook page 
or go to you have a YouTube page too as well, don't you, Nancy? I do. I have a YouTube channel and the book trailer is there, which I'm really quite proud of. My daughter helped me put it together and it's wow. very well done with the music and the photos. That'll give you a real feel for the book. And the first video that we did there is with Wilson. So it's it's easy to find. It's the Nancy Quinn channel or just the Go West Young Woman for the book trailer and meet Wilson. But yes, and, and it's it's worth a minute or two of your time to see to see Wilson. And you'll you'll fi- even if you're not a horse lover, you will fall in love with this horse because his personality will just wrap you up and put a bow on top of your head. That's how funny he is. <laughs> he really thinks he's a comedian with four legs. He definitely so, does. Tell, since we're on the subject of your book, the title of your book is Go West, Young Woman, and I, I love that title. What prompted you to write it? What is it about? And I know there's more coming. So first of all, why did you title it Go West, Young, young Woman, and what prompted you to write it? Well, the title the title actually was the very first chapter in the book, and it was the publisher who recommended that we make it the title of the book instead of just the first chapter. And the more I thought about that, I thought, you know, that's really a great idea because it does encompass the whole idea, the whole premise of the book. And we chose a, a beautiful photograph that is taken from my front porch looking out over the mountains and there's a rainbow coming down. And I love the rainbow because I think it represents hope, which is a theme in the book. And so I I have to give credit to the publisher on choosing the title. Um, As far as why I decided to write the book, You know, I have always really admired authors my whole life. I used to hold books in my hands and think, I wonder if I could ever do something like this. So when we came out here and I finally thought that I had some really interesting stories to tell and share, something that would inspire people or even just entertain them, maybe even educate but with humor, because I make a lot of mistakes in the book, and you can have a laugh at my expense, I don't mind. (laughs) So a lot of people would come to me and say, well, what happened to you this week? And I would get emails of, have you seen any more animals? Or the stories began to be more popular. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I can write them down and... Like I said before, if I really want to try something, just step out of your comfort zone and give it a try. So I decided to write a book and become an author, and it took two years of writing the book, and then it took me about a year and a half to find a publisher. During that time, because I've been in this business for a while now, during that time, did you ever want to give up? Oh sure. <laughs> Thank sure, I thought, you well, I can't. Yeah, I can't really do this. And then, um, even the editing process was tedious and horrible. And I didn't think I could ever get through it. And there was, oh, there was mistakes. And sometimes I wasn't clear, and I had to rethink. And my husband also helps me edit, and he would shake his head and say. This this doesn't make sense. You need to be more clear. So writing in itself is is a skill, just like any other skill that you learn. And so I think that's probably why it took me so long to put the polish on the first book, because it was a skill I was still acquiring. And I'm still learning new things, and I'm still honing my skills, even with the second book I'm writing. And And the second book, if I'm not mistaken, continues the misadventures of Nancy Quinn? It does. It's it's, um, 
Oh, I would say about the the next five years or so of of our western frontier adventure here. We're we're a little <laughs> more savvy and we're not making the same greenhorn kinds of mistakes, but you know, life continues to turn and twist and tumble and uh you've got to find some of the humor in that and so that's that's what the next the next book continues the story. Now let me ask you this as an artist when you went to Montana and you you got to see this this beautiful wildlife and it's not just the four-legged wildlife it's it's the the beauty of of the landscape with all of the different flowers and cactuses and in different tones of, of sunlight and sunsets and sunrises and the different colors of the earth and and how they mound up and and just the different environment around you did that inspire you as an artist to to draw and paint more than ever before it does it's it's right out my doorstep and so it is all available to me and we happen to be very fortunate to live in a a migratory path and so we see all kinds of animals all the time and it's a blessing so yes um it does inspire me now of course i have to divide my time between writing and doing the artwork so i'm i'm kind of running running two careers even though they do overlap because some of my illustrations I do put in the book, and I will be doing the same with the next book as well. And that was going to be my next question is, have you migrated these two beautiful crafts together to really showcase yourself? Because, Nancy, that ability to be able to not only be an artist, but to be an author and put to words those things that you have put in in drawings and in your artwork is marvelous. Well, thank you. I I try to in my writing, I try to create images almost almost paint pictures with words because our experiences here in Montana are so unique and there's so much beauty in the landscape. There's so much I want to convey. And so now, instead of just doing it on a canvas, you know, with, with paints and color, I, I have to find a new way to get that message across, and so I try to do it with words. So, yeah, I try to put a very artistic or emotional spin or bend on, on my words when I put them in the book. Do you find sometimes that having the dual careers that it's it's it sometimes it's a little bit harder to get the right feel, the right texture, the right color in the words as opposed to on canvas? Oh, absolutely. Writing is more difficult than the painting. I can I can mix all kinds of custom colors with my paints. I can uh, create even the tiniest minimal shadows in in my work with the pencil. But words are words. Uh, I can't really just go around creating my own words, and so I have to choose with what's there. It's the combination, and I think the feeling that you put behind them that makes them get your message across. And and that is true because a sunset is just a sunset to some people. But a sunset can be the most beautiful piece or masterpiece of God's handiwork to someone else, whether it's on canvas or whether it's in the setting of a book, depending, like you said, on the mastery 
of words they use to describe the sunset. Okay, the sunset. Well, yeah, we know the sun sets, but was the sun large? Was it orange? Were there pinks and yellows and greens? Were they vibrant? Were they pastels? You, you have to create that image that you already have on canvas. That's true, you do, um, and it it takes it takes quite a thought process to to do it justice. And every night here, we have almost a new a new canvas, almost like a new watercolor painting in the sky. And some of them are vivid and dramatic, and some of them are very quiet and subtle. And every one will evoke a different kind of emotion. I look forward to them at the end of the day because it gives me a moment to kind of reflect on what happened during the day and 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 the hope of a better tomorrow. And it 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 just kind of prepares me for the next day. So we all look forward to them. We stop whatever we're doing and we run to the window and we've been here 10 years and we still do that every night. That's enviable. I, I live in I live in Florida. I live in South Florida, and and the sunsets are gorgeous. But mm-hmm. in, they are. We, but we live in civilization, as opposed to on the side of a mountain where you're uninhibited by unnatural light and noise and tr- cars and other buildings. You just get to see nature in all of her glory. And and is it true, is it not true, that when the sun sets and the night comes, not only do you have the, the nocturnal four-legged visit, but you also have the nighttime beauty of, of the cactus blooming and the night flowers that bloom? It's it's always beautiful here, really. Even even in the dead of winter, there's, there's a beauty. The... The trees, after you get a little bit of snow on them when they melt and all the snowflakes kind of melt into into one, and the next morning when you see them frozen, they almost look like glass. Oh. And I call, them my, I call them my glass trees, and I look forward to that every winter. Um, in the summer, we have beautiful wildflowers all in the meadows. Um, in the fall... The aspens turn a, a red, orange, gold. You know, they're they're just amazing to see. And so, throughout the year, through every season, we do have something to enjoy. And it, for us, it's worth living out here. Now, the Costco is, you know, thirty, forty minutes away, and I still need that. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to completely give up all that. But it's worth the drive to come home and enjoy what we have. And, of course, you probably only go to town once or twice a month because <laughs> it takes you a good half a day to go to town and come back. Yeah, we actually end up going once or twice a week depending on what our needs are. Um, you know, doctor appointments or the kids have something going on in town or see their friends or what have you. So, But you're right, we don't make the commute every day. Well, let me ask you this. What is this third book that you, Oh, and ladies and gentlemen, before she gets into that, I have to tell you, today, June the 15th, 2017, is the one-year anniversary date of Nancy's publication of Go West, Young Woman. She published that book on June the 15th, 2016. So today we are celebrating the first anniversary of the publication of this book, so you have to go and order the book, and you can't go now. You've got to wait till we're done here. You'll miss something important, as in <laughs> the third book you're working on. What is it about? Well, you know, I'm, my mind is my mind is always writing books, and I think I tend to write them in my mind before I sit down and type them out onto the onto the computer, but. Yes, actually, I do have a third book in mind, and it's going to be centered around pr- probably more of like a collection of, of short stories of all the different types of animals that I've handled through my wildlife art career. 
and Ooh. some of them were domestic, some were exotic. But when you're working with wild animals, you always have fascinating stories to relate. Some of them are pretty darn funny. And would it be safe to say that, as with Wilson, who his Ladies and gentlemen, he he is a celebrity. So I, I highly suggest that y'all go over to Nancy Quinn's YouTube channel and and look at Mr. Wilson because it's going to go viral and and he's going to be getting fan mail and then you're going to have to set up his own Facebook page and we will have. You know, I've already had page. someone ask a question to Wilson, and well, see. he was so cute. I I answered for him. Well, but see, now you got to set up his own fan book page. His, it's a fan yeah, page. Yeah, I guess you you're right. Yes, yeah, set up a fan page for Wilson. But do you find that with all of the the wild animals that you that you handled, they all had their own unique personalities? Did they not? They do. There, a- any animal, whether it's wild or domestic or even the the different birds of prey any any living thing has its own unique personality and while there's some general behaviors in in different species i've still found that they're all unique they're just like people they all have their own ideas and feelings and reactions and behaviors it's it's fascinating i love working with animals and if and the stories they could tell, if they could talk, they would probably tell us, "You humans are so stupid." <laughs> you want us to sing for our supper? Okay then. <laughs> you want us to perform? Yeah. Why don't you get out here and do it? <laughs> I can just imagine. I, I some of the things that my horses saw, I don't even want to know. It's absolutely well, scary. Some of the well, they'll they'll give you the look, you know. They uh-huh. they're creatures of habit, and so you you start trying to teach them new things or get them out of their habits, and you take one look on their face, and they're letting you know exactly how they feel. Absolutely. Even my little Maltese tries to tell me what to do. Oh, I know, and and um, we have a lot of stories, Kobe. Our dog is another favorite in the book, and and when you'll find all kinds of things about his personality and his thought processes and how he thinks and behaves, and yep, they're all unique. Well, believe it or not, we're going to be running out of time pretty soon. I told you this hour would fly by. Oh, you're right. You're right. It absolutely <laughs> did. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this was Nancy's first time, and as with all my first-time guests, they they get a little nervous, afraid they won't have enough to talk about. But y'all know, that, y'all that have followed me from the beginning know that I know how to pull nuggets out and and find interesting things to talk about because that's what I do. Now, before we go and before you tell folks where you can be found, and, of course, we'll run through, we'll talk about the book for a minute and tell them where they can go get it. Mm-hmm. If a young person came up to you and said, Miss Nancy, I have this love of animals and I would like to be a conservationist or I would like to work with wild animals and law enforcement or I would like to work in a rehabilitation preserve with wild animals. How would I go about it? What would you tell someone to to do to do that? Well, I think the first thing they need to decide is exactly what it what it is they want to to physically do. If you want to handle animals, then I think going to volunteer at rehab centers is a great idea and it's a good start because people there uh, have plenty of experience and they can sort of help you and teach you in in that regard if you want to do more um, active awareness education type work then i suggest they might look into a club or uh, like uh, sierra club or ducks unlimited or something of of that nature to where they can get involved in that regard. I think it depends on what your personal goal is. 
Um, but, you know, all of, all of those places are going to have a basic respect for nature and, and conservation. So I would just suggest to them that they really think about where and how they want to make a difference. And would it be fair to say that we as humans are the only creatures that upset the delicate balance of nature? Because the the, the animals, especially the carnivores, only kill and, and eat what they need. They don't kill for trophies. They don't kill for sport. They mm-hmm. kill and eat what they're hungry for, and then the rest of the food chain comes down and helps clean the bones, and then the bones go back to dust. Mm-hmm. Well, but, but that's a cycle of life in general. And, right. And, you know, we as humans are going to, we're in a sense part, part of that, that cycle. And I think the best thing we can do is basically respect that life, but we're, you know, sadly we're always going to interfere with it to a point. We can't just remove humans from the planet. Um, and so the I best thought about it once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Are there some humans you wanted to remove? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Um, can I give you a list? Yes. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, you, I think the best we're going to be able to achieve is to just try to live in harmony and respect each other as best we can. But man will always be top on the food chain. And and that's a shame because man has forgotten that when we do unbalance that, it creates a void that can never be filled. True. But nature is strong, and it will always evolve, and it will always come back. I mean, even though certain species go extinct, they go extinct all the time. Um, Uh There's always a way that they come back better and stronger or or in a different um you know in a different capacity. So I have a lot of faith in in nature and I have a lot of faith in the environment. So I just have to look at it that again the best the best we can do is to try to get along um in a more harmonious way. And with that being said, where can you be found? Well, let's see. Um, I'm on Facebook, as you had mentioned. So I have a, a business page there. And I can be found on Twitter. Uh, let's see. I'm My books are on Amazon. They're in Barnes & Noble. In fact, I'm doing a series of book signings through Barnes & Noble. Um the publisher, Hellgate Press, currently has it on sale, so that might be a good place to pick up a paperback. Of course, Amazon has the the ebook version as well. I'm I'm pretty much everywhere, really. <laughs> I shouldn't be that hard to find. Now, where, which Barnes and Noble are you going to be at? In Montana or across the country? Well, currently, right now, um, I've just been staying in the state. So I've had a few of them here. I've been in Missoula. I'll be in Great Falls on the 24th. In July, I believe on the 15th, I'll be in Bozeman, Montana. Um, I am looking at expanding to do more travel. I'm not quite sure when that will be. But for now, I'm just doing the local appearances uh, within the state of Montana. So let me ask you this. When you get ready to release the second book, Would you be Mm -hmm. willing to come back and and visit with us for an hour and we can launch the book here? I would love to launch the book there. In fact, you know, I still have quite a bit of family in Florida, and I think it would be great to even be able to come to Florida and set up some series of book signings. Maybe we could even meet in person. Um, Oh, that would be be very honored. Wouldn't that be fun? But I'd be really honored to launch the book. Yes, that would be lots of fun. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. See, it's not that difficult to get people to come back and talk to me. I just have to ask nicely. I get lots of things. Well, you're done very that. easy to talk to, I have to say. I've I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I'm I'm much obliged. Well, thank you. I am honored because I've learned a lot from you 
And you've made me want to put Montana on my – I see the West is on my bucket list. Never thought about Montana, but now Montana is way up on my bucket list because – Oh, well, now you know, that I'm here, it's a must. See, you must come absolutely. now. Yes. It, think and it, think of the fun we could have. Oh, honey, the, the place would never be the same. <laughs> it probably <laughs> wouldn't. <laughs> we would have so much fun and create all kinds of problems, but that would be okay <laughs> because it would be us. So, ladies well, and consider gentlemen, consider it another chapter in the book. Oh yes, absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, as soon as we get done here, go on Amazon and pick up Nancy Quinn's book, "Go West, Young Woman." Because there are two more that will be coming out, and you want to continue the saga with her. And she has agreed to come back and launch her second book with us. And she'll have the title and everything by then. And we'll talk some more about her adventures, misadventures, and very interesting lives. Because we haven't even scratched the surface of the things that I wanted to talk to her about. And look up her artwork. Where can your artwork be found, Nancy? Well, probably the easiest would be to go to my website, which is quinnwildlifeart.com, and you can find most everything there. Is it for sale? Oh, yes. I've got lots of art for sale, note cards. And, we? And I know where I'm going friends. after the show. I'm going to <laughs> Nancy's website and order some stuff. I can't wait. <laughs> It'll be fun. I, I hopefully, I think you'll you'll enjoy it. I think you'd be happy with. Uh, I'm very oh, particular about how things are printed and put together, so you'd be happy with it. Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it first here. Go to Nancy's website. Go to her Facebook page. Go to her YouTube channel and look up Wilson. Maybe we can talk Nancy into getting Wilson his own fan page because he is a celebrity now, and we can ask him questions. He can answer them. That will be lots of fun. Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, I will have a new author on here, Miss Debbie DeLuise. She will be visiting us. And then Saturday night, we have bumped the show to 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time because we are going to celebrate my husband's 82nd birthday with dinner with the family, and I didn't want to knock Jane Jordan out of her night. So she graciously has agreed to push back our interview to 9 o'clock. So join us tomorrow night at 8 o'clock for Debbie DeLuise, Saturday night at 9 o'clock for author Jane Jordan. And remember this, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be successful, stop asking permission. And don't just feel special, be special. Your smile is your logo, your personality is your business card, and how you leave others feeling after having had an experience with you, you all know the answer to that. That becomes your trademark. Nancy, thank you so, so much for spending an hour with me, my dear. It was fun, and I appreciate you and you coming on here and educating us. Well, I really enjoyed it, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, you're welcome, and, and I do expect you back, so you got to keep me in the loop and let me know when your second book launches. And don't hang up after we go offline because even though what we say will be up in archives, I've got some things I need to tell you for you to have some more exposure in my gift to you. So, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Time, author Debbie DeLuise. Saturday night, 9 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Time, author Jane Jordan. And remember this, without dreamers, we would not have the society nor the culture that we have this day. So if you are a dreamer, your child is a dreamer, your husband, your friend, your parent, whoever you know is a dreamer, do not discourage them. Be encouraging of them and support them and support yourself. Believe in your dreams. Make them happen. Because if you don't, then you will have failed. Just like Nancy said, she tried many things. She did not fail. She succeeded because she tried. Trying is not failing. Sometimes our dreams take a different path, and that's okay. Know that... You will make your dreams real. 
If your child comes to you and tells you that he wants to be a Picasso or the President of the United States, or for that matter even a drag queen, encourage them. Because you never know what's around the bend, and our children are our future. They will be the ones that will make the big things happen in the next generation. So with that being said, I thank my guest, Nancy Quinn. Cannot wait to have her back. And, yes, I'm going to her website and get some of her stuff. You know it. Until tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time and Saturday night at 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, this is your host, Yvonne Mason, with my guest, Nancy Quinn, saying good night from off the chain. Good night. Now, we're off the air, but all this will go up in archives, but that's okay. What I'm going to do is when we get off the the phone here, the show will Mm -hmm. archive. When it archives, then I'm going to take and and put the link up on my page and tag you in it. Take the show and the link and put it everywhere. Put it on your Twitter feed, on your Facebook page, on your blog, on your on your web page, put it everywhere, share it with everybody. And then tomorrow... Oh, I definitely will. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, I will put the show up on Podcast, Podcast Garden, Spreaker, Mixcloud, and SoundCloud. And I will, once it gets loaded up, I'll put the link on my page again and tag you in it. And again, take those links and use them because this show is heard on those five podcasts plus iTunes, YouTube, FM.com, TuneIn Radio, and Stitcher. And Stitcher is heard on Sirius Radio. Wow. So you were, I'm not kidding when I say we're heard in over 65 countries. That's just wonderful. I, You know, honestly, I can see why your show is growing in popularity because you're just so genuine and and friendly and easy to talk to, and I have no doubt that your guests aren't, you know, lined up all the way through next year because you made it very easy on me, and I truly appreciate that. Well, sweetheart, you are most welcome, and you have made my day. You have made my week. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> because that that when I first started this many, many years ago, when when I first started in public life, I've been in public life since I was five years old because I worked for my father. Mm-hmm. But my my goal and my dream was to always treat people like I wanted to be treated. And when I stepped out of my comfort zone, I used to fake it until I made it because I really wasn't sure about things or how I was going to look with egg on my face. And I never wanted to put anybody in that position. So I watched a lot of Johnny Carson growing up. And I watched how mm-hmm. he treated his guest. And within two seconds from the time a new person sat in the chair, it was like they had known Johnny all of their life. And it was the way well, he made them feel. Well, it's a wonderful feel. gift. Yeah, it's a wonderful gift. And you have honed it into a skill and you use it very well. So thank you on behalf of everybody, not just me, but I think I can speak for everyone else who's been on the show too. Well, thank you, sweetheart, and I can't wait to bring you back. So let's shoot for I'm after excited the first about it. Yeah, I am, and after all the trepidation. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but just I think now it, we've I've really got something to look forward to, and and now that I've had the experience, it'll be it'll be easier next time. I might even do a better job. Oh, honey, you did a perfect job. You oh, like thanks. This. You did. You enlightened us. You made me see Montana in a different light. I mean, yeah, I've seen pictures and I've seen movies being made, but I'm not always sure they're made in the place they say they're made in. But you, mm-hmm. you make me want to visit Montana. Well, good. We, you know, we have cowboys and cattle and carnivores, but uh, there's there's a lot to offer here. And you're right. I think people think of it as kind of backwards and. Um, in some ways it is, but the other things make up for it. And if it is backwards, that's fine. We still need that untameness of our country. 
We do, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not seeing a rush of, uh, of development here in Montana. I don't know if there ever will be. I honestly think the weather keeps a lot of people away. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but like I said, there's a there's a certain beauty here. There's a, a certain rhythm of life here, and at least for now, it's it's working really well for us. And and I just wanted to share all that in the book. That's why I wrote it. Everybody seemed to enjoy the stories, and so I thought I'd get out there and give it a try. Well, I can't I can't wait to continue the saga. So hurry up, child, get it published. Let's get you back on. <laughs> Um, well, is the link is the link going to be up tonight? Because I'll actually do yes, a posting yeah. about it if it is. It will be up in about thirty minutes or so. Because as soon as it, okay. it once we hang up, it'll start going up into archives, and it takes a minute for it to get loaded up. And as soon as it hits mm-hmm. archives, because I I leave the site up because then I download it to, so I can upload it to the other podcast. And as soon as it I, goes green and tells me that it's it's up. I'm going to shoot it over to my Facebook page and tag you right in it. So, yeah, you will see it in about 30 minutes or so. Oh, I understand. Okay, well, I will keep a lookout for that. And a great big thank you, and I would give you a hug if I could. So just have a hug from the phone. I would hug you right back, too. Thank you, darling. And Tim, <laughs> please tell your husband thank you for his service. I will be happy to tell him that for you, yes. And I... Just let me know, and we will talk later. Okay, well, have a good night. Thank you for everything. You're welcome, sweetheart. Thank you, and good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It happens every summer. Stargazers delight in the opportunity to view constellations that can't be seen in winter, while car lovers delight in the opportunity to own one of our stars. At the Mercedes-Benz Summer Event, you can get the Mercedes-Benz of your dreams for less than you thought possible like the supremely intelligent E-Class sedan or the awe-inspiring GLC. Don't miss this once-in-a-summertime opportunity. Hurry in to our summer event. Visit MBUSA.com to learn more. Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Hi, you've reached the High Fashion Hotline. Hi, sweetie. Dad? I told you not to call me at work. But I need some style advice. Just go to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yep. All men's styles are on sale now up to 50% off with shorts from $12, active from $8, and tees from $5 at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. $5? Plus, the whole store is up to 50% off, so you can get amazing styles for everyone, even me. Going to Old Navy now. Oh, and make sure you get something for Father's Day, my treat. Thanks. High fashion, Old Navy. Valid 612 to 620. Excludes clearance, gift cards, register lane items, jewelry, today, and two-day-only deals.